This morning, if you would, um, I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. But before I do, I just want to again express our gratitude and our thanks for those who have served our country um, and especially for those who paid the ultimate price by sh uh, shedding their very lives to defend and to preserve the freedom that we so very much take for granted today. And so um, we just want to remember all of those who have served. Um, in the fall, we'll do Veterans Day, but um, this day was initially established to remember those who actually gave their life uh, for the Union Army in the Civil War and, and then was expanded to include all of the wars that we have fought. I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. It says this, Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourself were suffering. Today, is a day, or tomorrow rather, is a day of remembrance. Memorial Day began as an occasion to honor and celebrate Union soldiers who died serving their country during the Civil War. Memorial Day was inspired by the way people honored their dead in the southern states. And after the end of World War I, Memorial Day was extended to include all Americans, men and women, who died serving their country in any military action or war. Growing up, I came from a town that was maybe half the size of Alburnett. And I remember every year on Memorial Day, Memorial Day services would be held at our church. And I remember that um, they would come up and they would have two books. And one person would read the name and the other person would ra read um, the date that they died and where they were buried. And we would sit as they would go through this long list that got longer every single year of those who had served, some who had died in battle, and some who had died in later years. And then after that service was concluded, we would go out to the cemetery and they would hand those of us who were younger poppies the little paper, red flowers, and we would go around and we would affix those to the crosses that were there that represented uh, military people who had passed on in our cemetery. And then they would do the 21-gun salute and the playing of taps. It doesn't seem like that service happens very much like it used to. Or maybe it just doesn't happen where I'm at as much anymore. On Memorial Day, people often read a poem honoring fallen veterans or look up their family history and honor those in their family who have served our country. Many go to the cemeteries and put American flags or poppies on veterans' graves. And that's why it's known as, why it was known as Decoration Day for a while. It's a tradition for many to have a picnic or a barbecue on Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a kind of the unofficial, official first day of summer. Usually, kids are chomping at the bit to get out of school. But this year, things are a little bit different. And this weekend is traditionally the first camp out of the year. It's important to honor our veterans. We should honor every single one of them. Service in military changes your life. 
You give the best years of your life to your country. And some give the ultimate sacrifice. But all sacrifice, whether they are stationed during a time of peace or a time of war. Never forget those who made that sacrifice for you and your freedom. But tomorrow is a day to remember those who died while serving their country. Probably most people won't stop to remember. They're too busy. Or maybe they're just like this guy that I kind of relate to. Maybe you've heard about a guy named John who had a serious problem. One day, John ran into a friend that he had not seen for a long time. He greeted him and said, Bill, do you remember what I, when I had a, that bad memory that I had? Bill answered, yes, I certainly do. Well, it's not bad anymore. I went to a seminar that taught us how to remember things. It was great, and now I have a wonderful memory. Bill answered, that's great. What was the name of the seminar? Well, John said, wait a minute. My wife was with me. I'll ask her. He turned and saw his wife nearby. Then he turned back to Bill and said, what's the name of that flower with a long stem and thorns and a red bloom? Do you mean a rose? Bill answered, yeah, thanks, John said. Hey, Rose, what's the name of that seminar that we attended? Now, maybe you're not as forgetful as John, but many times we get so caught up in the things that we're doing that we just forget to remember those who gave their life for our country. Some people just forget. We can get too busy, or we get distracted, or we have a problem remembering, but we need to, to choose to remember our fallen heroes. We do that by flying flags. Some do it at half-mast. A good way to honor our fallen heroes is to remember the sacrifices that they made. I think the best way that we can honor the men who gave their all for our freedom is to live lives worthy of their sacrifice. Let me share some ways that you can do that. The first way is this. Live the life an American ought to live. Live the life an American ought to live. As a follower of Christ, we need to know, if we don't already, that we are a Christian nation. If you know that, <clears throat> you need to remember it. We're not merely a religious nation or a godless nation that... Uh, many are trying to say that we are, we are unequivocally and unapologetically a Christian nation. Let me rem remind you how we know that. Let's look at what our forefathers said and did that verifies that we are, in fact, a nation that was founded on Christian principles. Number one, we sing, my country tis of thee. Number two, Puritans first, the Puritans' first act at Plymouth Rock was to kneel, praise, and dedicate their new colony to God. Number three, William Penn, in writing government policies for Pennsylvania, made sure all treasurers, judges, and all elected officials professed faith in Jesus Christ. Number four, <clears throat> our founding fathers consistently spoke of the need for utilizing the Bible and Judeo-Christian values in defining and preserving this nation. Number five, 12 of the original 13 colonies incorporated the entire Ten Commandments into their civil and criminal codes. Number six, President John Adams stated the law given from Sinai was a civil and municipal code 
as well as a moral and a religious code. These are laws essential to the existence of men in society, and most of which have been enacted by every nation which ever professed any code of laws. Vain indeed would be the search among the writings of secular history to find so broad, so complete, and so solid a basis of morality as the Ten Commandments lay down. Number seven, the American Bible Society, and I wasn't aware of this, but the American Bible Society was started by an act of Congress in John Adams, our second president, served as its very first leader. <clears throat> Number eight, the Supreme Court building has carved on its front Moses and the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Number nine, the House of Representatives across from the speaker's seat is a sculpture of Moses. Number 10, <clears throat> George Washington said, it is impossible to govern the world without God and the Bible. Of all dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity, our religion and morality are indispensable supporters. Number 11, <clears throat> in 1782, the United States Congress voted in favor of a resolution recommending and approving the Bible for use in the schools. Number 12, Henry Lawrence, fourth president of the Continental Congress, stated, I had the honor of being one who framed the Constitution in order effectually to accomplish this great constitutional ends, it is especially the duty of those who bear rule to promote and encourage respect for God and virtue. Number 13, Patrick Henry, first governor of Virginia and a member of the Continental Congress stated, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not by religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number 14. Our Constitution ends with these words in the year of our Lord. Number 15. The nation's motto, which says, In God we trust. Our pledge, that where we pledge to be one nation under God. Number 17, on February 29, 1892, the Supreme Court declared in, high, in Holy Trinity versus United States that the historical record of America overwhelmingly demonstrated that the United States is a Christian nation. And finally, number 18, John Hancock, first signer of the Declaration of Independence, said, Resistance to tyranny becomes the Christian and the social duty of each individual. Continue steadfast, and with a proper sense of your dependence on God, Nobly defend these right, those rights which heaven gave and no man ought to take from us. All these facts can be found in the History of the United States of America, Volume 2, page 229. We were founded as a nation on Christian principles and on Christian laws. Our forefathers fought for freedom so that we could live as Christians. America has been so blessed because it has been 
a Christian nation. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 1, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. We have a duty to God and to those who won our freedom to live a life worthy of the sacrifice that has been made for us, both by Jesus and by those who have defended the freedom that we so very much enjoy today. Secondly, we need to be aware of the price for freedom. We need to be aware of the price for freedom. Thomas Jefferson said, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. When we get too many generations from those who fought for and won our freedom, we forget and have a tendency to take it all for granted. We think every country lives this way. We think everyone has the freedom to do what they want and to go where they want to go. We have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But that is a rare thing in our world. Unfortunately, our freedoms are slowly but surely being taken from us. People don't know the difference between freedom and liberty. They don't know what is right, what a, rather what a right is, or what a privilege is, or the difference. People don't know our history and the men and women who founded it. We are not vigilant by any means. And there are forces at work, people at work, who want to take our freedoms and rights from us. I'm not sure if my grandchildren's children will grow up in a world like we live in today. You know, it's interesting to me as we looked at all of those 18 different things that talked about how Christianity was embedded into our culture and into our country and into our nation. How Congress could have established the American Bible Society and chose to make the Bible one of the textbooks that children would learn from in school And then today we can turn around and say, well, they never intended that. Why, there's this separation of church and state thing. But I want to remind you that nowhere in the Bill of Rights, nowhere in the Constitution, does it mention this wall or separation of church and state. And that's not what we see when we look at early American history. Where that term actually comes from was a letter that was written to a church by Thomas Jefferson. And what he was talking about was not that the church should never influence politics. But he was saying that government should never influence the church. That this wall that was there was to prevent the government from doing what it had done in England. Where the throne determined what policy would be in the churches. And that's why so many came to America to seek the freedom to worship God as they saw fit, not as the Church of England told them or as the crown told them that they needed to worship. 
we need to educate ourselves. Because you will not get the truth in school at any level today. History is written and many times rewritten by the victors. There is a revision of history going on and most people believe it. They trust their leaders and their teachers. Also, it's too upsetting for many to learn the truth. And those who do educate themselves are often considered nuts or right-winged wackos by many. But the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Thirdly and finally, we need to remember we have an obligation to teach our children what it cost to be free. We have an obligation to teach our children what it cost to be free. Do you remember the struggle it was for God's people to take possession of the promised land? Moses brought them out of Egypt. And because of sin, because they had no faith or trust in God, they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness before entering into the land that God gave them. Joshua chapter 4 tells us about the crossing when they crossed over the Jordan River as they prepared to um, battle against Jericho. It says this, reading from the NIV, Then the whole nation had finished crossing the, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be, to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took the twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of, Israel's, of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up the twelve stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this very day. In the years and the decades and centuries that were to come, when one of the children asked about that pile of stones, the fathers could tell them about how God had been with them and brought them to this land that flowed with milk and honey. It was to be a reminder, a memorial, if you will, so that the people never forgot what God had done for them. The Passover, which they kept every year, and which Orthodox Jews still keep to this day, was a memorial, a reminder to them of how God delivered them from their slavery in Egypt. God understood that we need to be reminded or we forget. Memorial Day is about remembering. We've forgotten our history. 
We've forgotten the miracles God did in the battle for our country. How many have ever read about George Washington's vision or even heard of it? It's worth investigating. It isn't being taught anymore, and our children need to learn about it. You can Google it for yourself. But Memorial Day is about remembering. We need to remember our roots. We need to remember our heritage. If we don't, if we aren't vigilant, our children may not be able to enjoy what we have for so long taken for granted. It's important that we teach our children what it is that this nation was founded for and, and established and what it has stood for. It's important to realize the difference between a right and a liberty. Internet for everyone is not a God-given right. But the right to be free, the right to liberty, the right to justice, those are not liberties. And those are things worth fighting for. The right to be able to worship as we choose is a right worth fighting for. Let's remember those who have died to preserve the freedom that we have in this country. And let us never, ever forget the one who died to purchase the forgiveness of our sins so that we could be citizens not just of the United States, but citizens of heaven, adopted into God's family as sons and God, daughters of God. Tomorrow, as you celebrate Memorial Day, take a moment to remember those who sacrificed to preserve the freedom that you have today.